One of our moms in a newsletter closed say, Woo! I can with that mom. Okay, okay. <laughs> Moms for Liberty conference in Philadelphia. We're going to listen to that one again. It's just eight seconds, but I want you to listen to the crowd this time very carefully. One of our moms in a newsletter closed say, Woo! Woo! I can with that mom. Yeah. When she said, we had a mom who quoted Hitler, they cheered. <laughs> they cheered. They cheered for the idea of quoting Hitler. That's Moms Related co-founder, I think, Tina, I think that's Tina Dekovich, speaking at their summit in Philly. And if you, for those who are uh, listening and not watching, the quote that was used was posted in one of their Pens the Moms Related Pennsylvania chapters in their newsletter. Here's a screenshot of it on screen. But the quote is, he alone who owns the youth gains the future. Adolf Hitler, Adolf Hitler was placed in the newsletter of a Moms for Liberty chapter. And that was also quoted by a former congressman, Mary Miller from Illinois, quoted that in a speech the night before January 6th. So this group was born during the pandemic, has morphed into an increasingly controversial and, des and now a designated hate group by the SBLC. Two weeks ago, two of the co-founders appeared on 60 Minutes with Scott Pelley. And you know, the funny thing about that is they've been crying victim about that interview ever since and how unfair it was that he asked them about things they've actually said. So they talk a great game attacking others, but when the tables turn, suddenly they aren't into it. So I've been following this movement since it started, both as a political strategist, but also a dad of kids who are in school here in St. Louis, Missouri. And luckily, you know, this battle has raged everywhere, right down to the local school board, right to your street. So once again, luckily, I have the perfect guest to talk about this, how it's impacting politics, not just locally, but all the way to the presidential race. So, you know, let's not waste any time. Let's get out of the show. Welcome to On Democracy with F.P. Wellman. Oh, man. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome back on to Moxie with F.P. Wellman. So glad to have you with us. Another great week, another great show. I told you I have a great guest. Laura Papano is an award-winning journalist, author, has written about K-12 through and higher education for over 30 years. Her latest book is right here on screen, titled School Moms, Parent Activism, Partisan Politics, and the Battle for Public Education. Laura, welcome to the show. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So glad to be here. Glad to have you here on the Midas Touch with the Midas Mighty. Let's get right at. So, you know, I, I mentioned that, you know, as I was coming in, you saw I, I did I did the talk of, uh, you know, the supporting the lady who posted the Hitler quote. And then, of course, the, the yeah. brief, a brief chunk of the interview that the Moms for Liberty co-founders did with 60 Minutes a couple of weeks ago. And specifically the point, I really want to highlight that part where they talk about, you know, Scott Pell is kind of pushing them about, you know, saying people are groomers. I mean, yeah. tweeting at librarians, calling them groomers. And as a person, I was a I'm a Lincoln Project guy, right? So I caught all that, you know, and I know what they mean, but they were very evasive. And, and now they're on a campaign of victimhood since that uh, interview. Those are incredibly dangerous accusations that they're regularly being thrown around. You know, where's the truth about these guys? I mean, they knew what they're yeah. doing, don't they? Well, absolutely. I mean, I, I I went to the first Moms for Liberty and the second Moms for Liberty Summit. The first one was July 2022 in Tampa, Florida. And so I get down there and I register under my name. I'm not trying to hide anything, um, but I do dress to fit in. So uh, what does that mean? <laughs> what? <laughs> what does that mean? What is dress what to fit in? Is I wore a red blazer. Uh, I ordered two Moms for Liberty t-shirts. Uh, I wore some blue pants. And I, <laughs> key thing, I went and bought myself an American flag pin oh, and there put you it go. in the house. There so, you go. That's a suburban mom undercover. There you go. And so what I what I noticed is like as soon as I checked into the to the Marriott there, the woman at the desk is whispering. She said, I with you guys, I'm upgrading everyone. So then simply <laughs> I find myself on a high floor with a water view that I didn't even ask for. Nice. But I think the most um curious thing about the whole first summit was that it just so happened that kitty corner from the hotel was the Tampa Convention Center, which was holding Metricon, which is billed as the largest anime gathering in Florida. So here I am, you know, with my blazer, with the whole Moms for Liberty crowd, and on the streets, in the lobby, 
are people with horns and glitter and wings and colonial garb. It was like, <laughs> it was surreal. It was really surreal. And I mean, it, it was, it, it, it was a great setup. It was a great kind of visual metaphor for what I found when I went into the ballroom. Yeah. And I have to tell you, as a journalist, and as you know, you pointed out, I've covered education for over 30 years, I've been in a lot of different settings. And when I go into these settings, I'm not like, it's not my personal views that I'm interested in. I'm interested in what's the logic? Yeah. Does this make sense? Yeah. What, you know, what's the messaging? What's the point here? And I have to tell you that within the first 30 minutes, my jaw I was aghast. It dropped. I was, I heard from the stage that sending your children to public school for 30 to 35 hours a week was like sending them to a Maoist reform prison camp. Okay. I heard that social emotional learning, which I had written about as a columnist for the Boston Globe and my education column was a form of Marxist indoctrination and brainwashing. So I, I, and I have to tell you that for four days, I went to all of these sessions and I could, I was just stunned at how um, absurd it was. So when you hear that language of the groomers and they can't really explain it, well, welcome to what I saw at the Moms for Liberty. There is not, nobody is asking questions about does this make sense? And that was one of my surprises because I was sitting in that in that ballroom when one of the board members for Moms for Liberty is comparing the don't say gay law to an AK-47 needing a laser, some accoutrements. And yeah. I'm thinking to myself, Uvalde was a handful of weeks ago. Mm. Why is nobody finding a problem with using an automatic weapon as a metaphor. Mm. So, I, and I guess that's the, the surprising thing. And I guess the not surprising thing is what we have seen from Moms for Liberty is that people are not asking questions about what do you mean by that? Right. Is, you know, give me an example. And the result is that we have librarians, teachers, professionals who are facing attack. Yeah. And one of the interesting things that I learned at that first Moms for Liberty Summit was that the pitch that they were making, and I think what it speaks to your point about groomers, mm -hmm. the pitch was really an emotional pitch. They were told, you know what, you may not be used to speaking up at school board meetings, running for office, but you know what, your children are in danger. They are facing existential threat and harm at school from the very people who are educating them. Yeah. And that kind of stoking of fear, and we can talk about how similar that is to the Red Scare, but yeah. we can, but it, that's the sort of thing that results in a visceral emotional reaction without people running it through their brains and saying, does this make sense? Yeah. And I, I was struck by that in the book. You, know, you talk about red scare language and I've seen that too. And that was, by the way, the similarities are striking, right? What the whole thing, the red scare was, there was a communist in one place. Everybody's a communist and it's the same thing. They take one book in that interview, 60 minutes, she kept quoting a single book out of millions of books and millions of libraries, but they want to say, but this book is an example. And they extrapolate that to a larger fear tactic, a larger fear that they're out to get us. They're grooming our children um, when most kids have no idea those books are even there. And I laugh too. You'll appreciate this too. I, I went to school here in Missouri, Kirkwood, Missouri. I went to Knifer Middle School, still there, still standing. I haven't stopped by the bother in a while because I'm a grown ass adult. <laughs> but you know what? I checked out Mein Kampf. From the yeah. library, because I had a teacher, by the way, that's a whole story. We could do a whole show on that experience. But anyway, he suggests I check it out. And I was a big World War II buff. I opened that thing, closed that thing and put it away. But I think back, that's 1978, mm -hmm. you know, and, and how the, apparently it'll be probably, it's probably still there. It'll be freaks out. But we don't freak out about that. But here we are now in 2024 and these these horrible accusations are being thrown about decent people just trying to do a job for, by the way, a pittance of money 
to do that yeah. job for our kids. And and they're they're stirring up this anger. And and the and the mash really came off when you were there in person, didn't they? They really don't try to hide. I mean, the clip I opened with is, oh, you know, we had a lady quote Hitler, and someone cheered her from the crowd. Which I don't think she expected. <laughs> you know, some no, of the I crowd know. cheered yeah. for Hitler, for God's sake. No, and that was, yeah, that was at the second summit this in um, Philly. What yes. was interesting between the first summit and the second summit was that the first summit was really a pitch to moms. You need to, and it was mostly moms, there were a few dads, but mostly moms, moms, you need to stand up and, and activate yourself and go out and, and kind of share this dogma, if you will. Right. And by the second summit last July in Philly, everyone had bought in. Mm. And it was really striking that nobody needed to pers- you know, explain or persuade. What was interesting, though, is, and you know, we may talk about this a bit later, um, is the objections and the recognition of how absurd this is. Mm. The, at the first summit, there were only a few protesters out on a small, you know, traffic island across from the hotel. And, you know, some of the moms groups uh, were mocking them on Twitter. When I went to the to the uh, summit in Philly, uh, there was there were, uh, were quite a lot of protesters. And I have to tell you, I'm sitting in the opening breakfast in Philly, and T- Tina Deskovich is describing Philadelphia and talking about you know the forefathers who walked these streets. And I'm thinking to myself. I didn't understand why they held it in Philly. I mean, Philly is one of the most diverse, welcoming mm-hmm. cities in America. Yep. And they picked a hotel in the neighborhood. So I am <laughs> I am completely flummoxed. And I realize that the disconnect of just not seeing certain people and certain things. And I did the same thing. I brought the same blazer. I brought my, you know, American flag pin. But the difference was is we were kind of told that we are cautioned that we shouldn't wear our lanyards on the street. Ah. So of course, I was. I wrote a piece for Slate, and I was um, interviewing a number Slate and the Heckinger Report, and I was interviewing a number of um, the protesters. But I couldn't go out there wearing my red blazer, no. so I would leave. The, the summit, go up to my room, change into black t-shirt and jeans, go out, <laughs> talk to people, do interviews, go back in, go upstairs, put the blazer back on and go back to the summit. <laughs> because it really, I mean, it w- was really clear that there was there was tremendous um, objections. In fact, the opening um, cocktail uh, event for the Moms for Liberty Summit was held at a museum that was only a few blocks from the hotel. And I would normally just walk there, but we were told that we needed to take the bus. And when I got off the bus, I saw why. They were heavy police presence, tons of protesters. It was just a really um, frothy kind of event. That's just, well, I mean, as as a, as a person on the opposite side of them, it makes me happy. I mean, I, you know, I think I think they need to be aware. And then this one was hot. I mean, I've, I've been watching clips all week of, you know, uh, Mark Robinson spoke and gave a speech. You know, every, all the politicians showed up, you know, yeah. showing the power of the organization. And one of the things you mentioned when, you were, when we were talking in the pre-show conversation is, you know, the connection between, you know, Moms for Liberty and the and, and, and the relationship, what we see on the ground of the Moms for Liberty activists, the school and the top of the ticket. And you saw that in person, I think, in Philly as these mate now they're 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 a made group in that sense there's almost a disconnect now because we are and we'll talk later made group (laughs) yeah i mean they really are right they're part of the the machine now in a lot of ways even as they seem to fracture on the bottom side i mean uh, what's that connection to you how do you see that 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 connection yeah, the, so the I actually saw the seeds of that connection back in uh, tampa okay and what i saw was that um Ron DeSantis from the stage said, I am endorsing for the first time ever 30 school board candidates. Ah. Now, how often do governors typically endorse school board candidates? Yeah, they don't. They don't. So throughout the whole summit, people were asked if they were running for school board to stand up and everyone was applauding. Wow. And what was and, and mm-hmm. what struck me was that obviously they were very flattered that Ron DeSantis 
you know, when he looked like a promising presidential candidate. <laughs> uh, times have uh, changed. Back, back then, um, <laughs> that he was endorsing them and they were completely flattered. But the, but I was sitting there thinking to myself, oh, no, no, it's the other way around. Mm. What DeSantis is doing is activating for himself, right. you know, a ground army of highly organized, networked, motivated moms. I mean, one of the themes in the book is that, you know, and the reason I call it school moms is that there is a long history of women being organized and, and active and getting things done, but not getting a lot of attention or credit for it. Yeah. And I think that's something that's, that DeSantis spotted and other people have spotted now is that this the bottom of the ticket, these school boards are really, really, um, they're, they're a great opportunity. As Steve Bannon noted yes. at CPAC in 2022, he was the one who said, you know, after, and we can talk about the, the what happened in North Florida, which really was the model for this, yeah. um, in North Dallas, rather. Um, and he, uh, he said, school boards are the key that picks the lock. This is how we take over, district by district, town by town. And what he was talking about was, one, on the one hand, Turnout for school board races is pretty darn low. Yeah. Some in Texas that I was looking at and followed had turnout of eight and ten percent. Jeez. And they typically have been, you know, people who run for school board have just, you know, done it with their friends and a couple hundred dollars in a Xerox machine. Well, suddenly you pour some serious cash into this. And and you can sway things pretty seriously, yep. and that's what happened in um, in North Dallas. You had um, in in those suburbs, you have Patriot Mobile, um, which your listeners yep. may or may not know is a Christian cell phone company. Yep. And in January 2022, they decided to start a super PAC, the Patriot Mobile Action Pack, and they spent over four hundred thousand dollars on 11 school board races in four districts Jesus, and they poured the money in and you will appreciate this is that there's a lot of money got spent at a place called axiom strategies in kansas oh, Jeff Rowe. my buddy jeff Rowe. he loves there me he loves lincoln <laughs> i bet he does we're buddies but they spent, I mean, and you know, Axiom does DeSantis' yep. work and Ted Cruz and Glenn Youngkin. So suddenly you have these national level political strategists who are producing materials and offering help to school board candidates. And you see box trucks and you see flyers and glossy, um, you know, mailers landing on people's doorsteps. So you go to vote. And many people don't know the issues, don't know the candidates nope. Nope. and haven't had to. Nope. And the result is that name recognition carries the day in a lot of these cases. And that's yep. and there have been some pretty serious consequences, especially in places like Keller, Texas. Or Rockwood School Division here in St. Louis County, where exactly that happened two years ago. Somebody somebody dumped twenty five thousand dollars into a couple of candidates. One of those was a, a woman who actually ran a sugar baby website. That was awesome, <laughs> and uh, not making that up. And her husband was one of the sponsors of that movie about sex trafficking, uh, producers. And then another woman who was even less qualified. And and my um, a, a friend of mine was in the grocery store after the election, after these nut jobs won. And this person was talking to another person, lamenting, said, you know, I'm kind of embarrassed. I, I didn't know who they were, but they had the most signs. So I figured they were probably the best candidates. <laughs> you know, and you're like, ah, my hair was brown when I moved here. <laughs> and, you know, but you're right. It does. A little bit of money in a school board race. I mean, look, $25,000, that's that's chump change in a congressional race or chump change. In a, that's a, sh a shit ton of money in a local race. Yeah, in a school throw board. in 400000 And I think Jesus. to your point... Um, what was interesting about that second summit, yeah. uh, really the Moms for Liberty summit, well, guess who the major sponsor was suddenly? Mm -mm, no. Patriot Mobile. Jeez, man. And guess who introduced Donald Trump and was I, most certainly behind the five presidential candidates who showed up to speak to these moms? Lynn, you know, Lynn Wamsgon, who is the executive director of Patriot Mobile Action. Jeez. So suddenly you have... You know, a pretty well, 
you know, he well healed, well organized, savvy group that is helping to move these moms in the direction that they want them to move in. Yeah. And, you know, certainly moms, you know, we use soccer moms, security moms, new security moms have long been a really, really key and important demographic. Yeah. What's interesting about this round is that moms are running more of the action rather than being the kind of the demographic, the target. you know, target of it. Yes. It's a great place to take a pause. We have two great sponsors this week, our friends at Human and, and Factor. So let's uh, let's visit our sponsors. We'll come right back to this topic. I got a good question for you. Let me tell you guys, eating better has never been easier with Factor's delicious, ready to eat meals. Now look, they're fresh, never frozen, chef crafted, dietitian approved, and they're ready to go in just two minutes. And my God, I love them. I mean, these are really good meals. I've had ready to eat meals that taste like the old MREs I ate in the army and factors anything but. You've got over 35 different options to choose from every week, including Calorie Smart, Protein Plus, and Keto. Also, what I love, there's about more than 60 add-ons to help you stay fueled up and feeling good all day long. I ask you, what are you waiting for? I mean, you can get started today after your diet goals. You're just healthy goals. And the best part is it's quick and easy two minute meals that let you fuel up fast. It's restaurant quality. You can get pancakes, smoothies, more, a wide variety of really easy options for an entire day of food. No prep, no mess. Pop a hole in it. You can microwave it. Comes out perfect every time. And when you do it, you can pause or rescheduled deliveries at any time. Maybe you don't eat them all. Sometimes you're out of town. Factor makes it very easy to manage. Factor is the perfect solution if you're looking for fast, and I do mean premium options with no cooking required. So all you gotta do is sign up and save. We've done all the math for you. Believe me, I'm on a budget just like you are. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved to be nutritious and delicious. I've I've eaten so many of them. I gave them to my girlfriend. Truly delicious, fresh meals right at your doorstep. So here it is. Just head to factormeals.com slash Fred50 and use code Fred50 to get 50% off. That's code Fred50 at factormeals.com slash Fred50 to get 50% off. Try it. You will not regret it, I promise. Heart health and staying healthy, especially when you have family, friends, or loved ones that you want to be able to spend as much time with as possible, is so important. You know, February is Heart Health Month in the United States, and more than half the population would still benefit from blood pressure support. Super Beats Heart Choose, the number one doctor, pharmacist, and cardiologist recommend a way to support healthy blood pressure, and they even promote heart-healthy energy without the stimulants. Paired with a healthy lifestyle, the antioxidants in Superbeats are clinically shown to be nearly two times more effective at promoting normal blood pressure than a healthy lifestyle alone. And with over 40,000 five-star reviews and counting, people are raving about Superbeats heart shoes. Superbeats heart shoes are absolutely delicious and are truly much better than any alternative supplements out there. I take my Superbeats heart shoes each morning and it's really helped me kickstart my day. And after taking my Superbeats heart shoes, I feel like I have more energy and I'm ready to take on the day. Super Beats Heart Shoes support healthy circulation. So you not only get blood pressure support, you also get productive heart healthy energy without the crash. So support your heart health with Super Beats Heart Shoes. Get a free monthly supply of Super Beats Heart Shoes on all bundles and a free full size bag of turmeric chews valued at $25 with your order by going to our spot, democracybeats.com. Get this exclusive offer only at democracybeats.com. That's democracybeats.com. Check it out. I swear by them. Okay. I, I, hate, to, I hate taking it. There's times in the show, I don't want to take a break. But <laughs> so, and this is one of those times, you know, the, the, the caveat to my story I was telling you though, was the next year, which was our last cycle, last April, we have April 
April local elections are nonpartisan here in uh, Missouri at the local level. Um, the opposite happened. And this is such a great point you made. The moms did organize the second time. The moms who were not moms for liberty. And of course, moms would have got kind of mainstream. So we actually knew their list of, of candidates. And what we saw that I loved was that the, the normies, if we call them normies around here, the normies got together and they ran a coordinated campaign, the three of them. And it's one of those mm -hmm. open board seats where the top three vote getters get on the board. Okay. And so they had a coordinated campaign. He had signs with all three names of, you know, reasonable, you know, and they use the right word, you know, reasonable you know, stuff. And they ran a very good campaign because they ran it together instead of trying to run alone. And they swept it. They swept the table. They swept the Moms for Liberty candidates, all got swept out of the school district. So there was hope in that. And that's your right. It's, it's kind of what you said. Now that moms, and that was my next question, worked out perfect. Moms are organized. I and mean, that's what you said. That, that's why I loved about the book is school moms isn't, a, this isn't a book about Moms for Liberty. It's, it, oh, it is. No. That's what I love about it. So, which is a great, that. that's my best. That's exactly. That's why I wanted to get the second half of the show is not those guys. The second half of this is about the fact that these are some heroic moms. And you told a wonderful story and you did it on the Red, White, and Blue podcast, but I wanted to pull the thread again is because I have the flag out front of my house that says women's rights are human rights that all, all wives, you know, it, it's, it is, um, it is such a, a basic statement of human rights, if you will. And I'm very proud to have it out there. And it led to some controversy. One of the, one of the anecdotes you tell in the book is how a mom spotted that flag that had been there for years in a teacher's, um, classroom and it led to a lot of things could you tell me more but tell us more about how that led yeah, so that's it's a great um, case that's study in Le yeah, that's in uh southern lehigh and it's uh well you know that very point that you're making these signs and things that have been here forever right. are suddenly becoming these kind of flashpoints Political. and i actually saw that in north idaho where people were raising questions about a rainbow and an elementary school mural that had been painted 25 years ago. Goodness. So that sign, that point, that sign's been around forever, yeah. but somebody took a photo, put it on social media and kind of started charging that this was a form of, you know, indoctrination and, you know, and, 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 there, it became so hostile that there was um, a mom who had been um, a mom of two who had been a teacher for 22 years and actually was just retiring from that role. Um, and she, she said, you know, this is ridiculous. Kids are feeling, kids are, she goes, my kids and all the kids are watching these school board meetings because they want to hear what the adults are saying. And it's not pretty it's not very yeah, kind right so she made a sign with a friend of hers who is a graphic designer that just said you belong you matter we are all southern lehigh and it was just meant as a kind of pretty innocuous you know reminder to students who are watching what the adults are doing that they are appreciated and loved and welcome and that they belong yep. so she made the sign put it out in, a, in front of her house and a couple other locations. And then a uh, people started noticing it right away. A teacher in uh, the intermediate school said, gosh, where can I get one of those? And she was selling them for 10 bucks, which is, you know, what it costs to make them. So, and the, there were two of them. And so Kristen Brock got two signs, gave them th to the teacher who I interviewed. And the teacher brought it into her classroom. And it just so happens that that day there was a parent who was walking around the hallways, spotted this and was very, very upset and, and claimed it was a political statement. And the teacher who had it um, was describing to me how she has a box in her room, which I think is this is a just a lovely thing. And she says, it says, I wish Mrs. Cooperman knew. Mm. And the box was about if there was something that you want to tell the teacher and you just want them to understand, just slip it in the box. If you write your name on it and you're not required to write your name, then I'll respond. And so some, uh, you know, a girl had written a note that said, is it okay to like a girl if I'm a girl? And so this teacher checked with the counselor and, and got some, and, and they ended up having a conversation walking around the hallways and it made the, the student feel welcome, supported, and it gave the student confidence to then go talk with her parents, which she did. And it all worked out fine but the signs that started it all 
became a really hot divisive political issue in town. And you had school board meetings at which they were, you know, threatening to draft rules about what could be hung on on walls in classrooms. So it was just a a really, really divisive thing about a sign that was just about belonging. And interestingly, um, uh, you know, they ended up not had not kind of outlawing the signs, but it created such division that people, you know, people were not like kids who's played together on the same lacrosse team. The parents couldn't talk to each other anymore. I mean, this is the kind of tragedy of what we're seeing around the country is that schools are not supposed to be partisan places. Public schools are for everyone. They are, I never knew what my friend's politics were. I never, as a PTO mom, I never knew. I didn't care. It did not matter. It was about the community. And I think that we're seeing some of that suffering on the flip side, the moms that you mentioned who are gathering pushing back, organizing like the ones in your community. That's a really positive sign. That's a very positive, you know, people are connecting around the importance of showing up. Yeah. Democracy is not a spectator sport. And and we're seeing, and you make a great case in the opening, in the introduction of the book about the importance of public schools and how they are more than just a curriculum and this focus on what teachers can and cannot teach. And you make a really compelling case, I thought of, no, it's much more than that. It is a community. Is And as funny as I read that, I was thinking, somebody literally asked me in an interview just recently, I did uh, for another uh, a journalist, you know, what, what, what were your parents' politics? And, and, you know, I have, I still don't know. <laughs> They've passed. Uh, but, I, I, you know, I don't know my friends. Poly- they asked, well, were your friends Republican in high school? Like, no, we didn't talk about that. I mean, it wasn't a, a thing in 1983 what your politics mm-hmm. were. And so mm-hmm. – and I'm seeing the assault in our schools not just through what you're talking about. They, we, we were dealing with the school privatization and the school voucher. They're the same – they kind of get balled in the same thing of undermine these public schools. They defund them. Then they say they're failing. Make us – what is the case for public schools in your opinion? So the case for public schools, I mean, John Dewey was the one who said it's the experience of school that matters. He said, we are training our next generation of citizens and we're not doing it in civics classes. We're doing it by virtue of people different from you attending school all together. So the case for public schools is that we need public education for our democracy. The fact is that about 90% of children in America attend public schools. We can go crazy with charters or vouchers, but that's 7.5% of all children's attendance. So what's interesting, and I think part of the friction today, is that in 1986, you know, 70% of those children were white. Uh In 2020, only 46% of those children were white. So we are, we have a very different demographic, but if we think for one minute that it doesn't, that some children don't need to be educated, don't need to feel like they can belong and become contributing members of society. I mean, on a purely economic, logical argument here, I mean, everybody needs to get educated and become part of our society and public schools are a wonderful vehicle for doing that. Do I think that public schools are perfect? Of course not. I have spent 30 years poking <laughs> holes and finding problems with things that, that public schools do. I think much like nurses, we elevated pay for nurses and we got a much better quality of people doing nursing. And now it's such a fantastic profession and with great people and in great demand. I think we need to do that for teaching. Yeah. I mean, we need to put the money and effort and attention into education. Right now, the pitch, you know, if you see all the voucher legislation that is passing in state legislatures, yep, that is all about privatizing, taking money out of the public schools and putting it into private schools, often kind of Christian schools that are, you know, the kind of modern day version of the post, you know, Brown versus Board of Education segregation academies. Yep. But it's not going to do us any good in the long run as a society. Yeah. We do need to educate everyone. And the this institution of public education is set up to do it. 
Yeah. Do we need to do some things to make it even better? Absolutely. Yep. And but that's I, not the conversation that we're even having right now. No, and that's the brilliance of it. that's the gaslighting and the and the and the and the hand waving. They've defunded and underfunded schools. When the schools don't meet performance, they say, "Well, look, your kids are getting bad educations. That's what we should we should put your kids." It's 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 a it's a cycle that's been going on since I was a kid, right? Since you were a kid, they've been trying to do this. I am one of those kids. You talk about the the desegreg the segregation categories. I live in St. Louis, Missouri. My elementary school, we you know Kirkwood High Kirkwood School District where I grew up still is under a desegregation order <laughs> wow. 50 years later, right? Wow. My my neighborhood elementary school, Osage Elementary, was closed when I was going into fifth grade, and we white kids were bused to another school because there was only one black child in the time I was living there. And so we I've lived this life. I've lived, you know, I've I lived, I grew up with it. And it's it's troubling to see that fight. Now, there's been an increasing backlash to these efforts, right? We're seeing people are fighting back against about about the, you know, organizations, as you mentioned, the school moms are mobilizing and with with increasing uh increasing success. Um they're, they're even as you mentioned a couple times in other speech I've seen you talk give Christian women are using their skills to to organize against these anti CRT and edge because the kids are being left out. Um, is there hope there? Are you seeing an organized backlash? I mean, I, I, we have seen fracturing of moms for liberty. These other groups that are leading these charges, yeah. they've seen like they've lost their ways because they started off, you know, anti anti COVID, right? <laughs> it wasn't always they, they've kind of and they've gone really off the deep. Even I think they've gone they had to find new things to be mad about, and now some of this stuff's getting really stupid. And then you throw in you know founders having threesomes and other weird shit, <laughs> you know. So is there hope? Do you think at the local level, or or where do we go from here? I guess is the next next question. So I, I think there's absolutely hope i love hope but, i love hope but love hope too i'm an op i'm an optimist by nature yeah but vigilance is really really key well, because there you go. even though the moms for liberty are not everywhere and you know they did uh, suffer in november elections we also they are did. aware that you know many school board races were not held in november there are a lot yeah. of school board races all across the country and what moms for liberty did though is they activated a kind of national anti-education language, anti-teacher language, anti-librarian language. And even if you are not a, an official member of Moms for Liberty, we are seeing far-right candidates that are just picking up that language, yeah. not even really running it through their brain yeah. and, and employing it in running for office. I mean, I was in, I did a story for the Heckinger report that was in Vanity Fair in December, where I spent about six months following um, a school board in North Idaho. And what I saw that the school board got taken over by far right candidates. And, you know, in one of them won by eight votes, right? And I interviewed the mom who lost and she said, oh, my friends just assumed that I would win. <sighs> So, you know, it's like we have you have to show up. Yeah. But what happened is moms in the community organized. They recalled two of the candidates, two of the far right candidates. I was at a meeting at the end of August in with 150 people in this rural community mm. who were like, no, we need public schools. Mm. And they and then I was there on Election Day when they had three more uh, candidates running. They only won two of those, but they have a majority on the board. But what you saw, it, what I saw was the transplantation of national language on a local district. And I think this is what we have to be aware of. And what I saw was that candidates who were running against kind of reasonable pro-public school candidates, and, and please understand that in this particular district, most of the people who were fighting for public education were conservative, religious, Republican moms. Sure. So this is the kind of reasonableness. But what we, but what, what we, what I saw was that candidates would run on issues like transgenderism. Mm -hmm. Now, transgenderism is a made-up idea. And it's a kind of derogatory negative idea around transgender students right. but they were running on that as a platform. And I stood at one of the polling places on a dirt road, listening to one of the far right candidate campaign workers telling voters that her candidate would keep boys out of girls bathrooms when that was not the issue in the district. Yeah. 
The issue in the district was that the levy failed. So they lost a third of their budget. They were a, a principal was talking about mice running over children's feet because the school hadn't been cleaned. They had rescinded their They'd ordered the English language arts curriculum because it was out, their current one was out of print. They were entering their second year. They'd gotten the curriculum, but because it contained social emotional learning, they sent it back. And as a result, children had no new English language arts curriculum. I interviewed a fourth grade teacher who had 10 workbooks for her entire class, and she was done with the materials that she had left by October. So you were creating these real traumas for kids learning to read because we are grafting national language, national anti-education language onto local school board races. Yeah. So to your point, pay attention, beware, show up. Just because it's not Moms for Liberty doesn't mean that somebody else isn't adopting that language, that platform. And I think especially in you know 2024, we have to all be paying attention because this, you know, school board does matter because school board is gonna happen alongside all of these other races. We need to get in the habit of showing up and voting. Every time for every race at all. Every levels. time. And yeah. running reasonable can supporting reasonable candidates and volunteer. I tell you, and that's the lovely thing about a school board race or there, you can, it's easy to get involved. There's small districts. It's easy to go out. I mean, and you, what you said was so key. It is name recognition is my God. I tell people the lovely thing. One of my favorite things about these small local races, is no shit standing on the side of the road with a sign waving it like crazy and get cars to horn, haunt their hornet. It works. <laughs> you know, I tell the story all the time of a judge in my hometown when I lived in Georgia and they're not really allowed to campaign. And so what he did was every day at rush hour, both ways, he'd park on the side of the road, he'd have a set signs up and he'd sit there and it had enough room where people could pull off the road and say hi. And that's all he did. He just waved signs and people would pull off and say, what are your issues? What are you? And it, he won by a landslide. It, it, there's so much you can do within your local school district and your local uh, city council that is, I just, I hope all those watching, we have thousands of Midas Mighty, especially, and not a day goes by in the comments on one of my videos where somebody says, well, what can I do? And I always tell them, find your local race, find the can you like, help and don't it doesn't have to be writing checks just a little blood sweat and tears and make show it up, knock on show doors. up I mean, yeah especially i mean what that patriot mobile race that yeah. i that yeah. Ray says now we have project 1776 has a pack all of these far right groups are now funding Yikes. local school board races so are we going to be able to counter all of the, you know, can people counter all of the money that's being poured in? Not necessarily, but you know what? You can show up, you can knock on doors, you can talk with your friends at the sidelines of soccer games. You can make sure that the people who are elected actually want to support public schools and public yeah. education. Yeah, my partner, Heather, um, during that last school board race, candidate who had been previously on the school board was running to get back on it, stopped at our house. And I knew the guy. I, I knew I could tell when he's walked up where he's where he stood. And I believe he's on the Moss for Liberty list. And God bless her. She went out there. So I'm talking to him. And, she went, <laughs> and they stood the driver for 20 minutes. And she says, Fred, it was great. For most of the time, it was pretty reasonable. He had a reason. And at the end, she goes, well, she goes, well, I don't know where your district is. Well, you know, I worry about this transgender. <laughs> You know, I was really transgender, and luckily, being being you know dating and, and having dated for four years a guy who's in politics, he goes, "Really? How many transgender students are there in our state?" And he looked and goes, how? "And she asked him, how many transgender students are there in our state and in our district that have wanted to play sports otherwise?" Well, I don't know. You don't know. I'll tell you, it was seven. <laughs> you know, in the whole state. And uh, it was great. And she made him squirm. And God bless him. Again, that was the cycle where he lost. Um, so learn wow. what's going on. Learn the numbers in your local area. Don't be afraid to have those conversations, these guys, and hold them accountable for their lives. Well, Laura, I've taken a lot of your time. I appreciate you. The most important thing is you can see the book here on screen if you're watching. But even for people listening, Laura, where do they find you? And where do they find the book? Because you got to buy this book. Yes, get it wherever you can. And I will tell you that the book, Amazon, uh, bookshops, you know, your yeah. local bookstores, it's not long. And I, that's on purpose. Yeah. I What I did as, as somebody who's covered education for 30 plus years, I've seen all these things. So when they came in new, in new clothing, I was ready. Yeah. So there, this is really their stories in here. It's about connecting the dots. It's a quick, easy read. And um, I also have a website, laurapapano.com. I'm 
putting all the interviews and everything on there as well and where I'm visiting and going. And um, I really appreciate talking with you and being on the show. Oh, I love it. Glad to have you. Mai's Mai's going to love you. Appreciate all your time. Keep up the fight and the good work. I know. I don't know how you do it. I couldn't imagine sitting through three or four days of Moms for Liberty Conference. So uh, thanks for uh, thanks for your service. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Well, we'll talk to you soon. All right. Take care. Man, that was a fun interview. I really enjoyed that. And um, Laura's remarkable. She was t I was tipped off, by the way. My friend Rachel Vinman, former former guest of the show, Rachel Vinman, t t tipped me off to Laura. It really is a wonderful book. And, and there's some great anecdotes. There's a lot of stories in there that I really enjoyed. As I mentioned, you heard a couple of them today. Um, definitely worth and such an important issue. And that's why I want to take time on the show. You know, we talk about it's called on democracy. Uh, and this is such a key part of our democracy. The school board level democracy, the schools is part of our democracy. You heard her case of public schools being so important. Our community is part of this democracy, constitutional republic. I don't care what you say. It is what it is. And and that's such – it starts right in your neighborhood. It starts where your kids are going to school. The idea that kids can't get along or hang out because of the politics of the parents is an abomination for our nation. And so I'm hopeful and excited, and, and we can do this. You can do it. You can be part of the fight right in your own neighborhood. Uh, we're, our local elections in Missouri are coming up in April, as a matter of fact. So you live here in Missouri, one of my neighbors, get on out there and help find out who's involved in these local elections. They're supposedly nonpartisan, but you and I both know better than that. So look, great conversation. Definitely check out her books. That's um, that's School Moms, uh, Laura Papano. Really loved it. In the meantime, a lot of crazy stuff going on. We'll probably get back to national issues next week. As you know, the RNC and the, and the TNC, the Trump National Committee have all blended into one thing, and <laughs> it's going to be some interesting times. Uh, you by the time we get together next week, uh, our friend uh, Mr. Trump will have uh, <laughs> given up some of his property, I think, to Letitia James, and uh, I think that's hilarious. <laughs> so uh, the the fight goes on. In the meantime, uh, if you haven't caught it yet, I'm really excited about this series we're doing. You got to kind of dig for him a Midas Touch button. Midas Touch Network, we're doing a series called In the Hot Seat. Uh, you can look at the playlist for FP Wellman. There's a playlist in the Midas Touch of my videos. You can find all of our videos under that, under the Fred Wellman playlist. Um, but that's where I've been interviewing candidates for higher office, Congress and higher, uh, the, for the last couple of weeks, and we got more coming. Um, probably by the time you see this, Lucas Kuntz will be out there, but I talked to Gloria Johnson in Tennessee. I've talked to Colin Allred in Texas. Um, Kaylee Peterson, who's running in Northern Idaho, where the same place where Laura mentioned. So I hope you'll go check out those videos. They're doing great. They're really easy. 15, 20 minutes at most. I got to shorten them back down again. Um, but they are really important. A great way to find out who's running in these key races. Find out what the issues are in those races and see where you can help. So I hope you'll check out In the Hot Seat with FP Wellman. So many great things. Man, there's a lot going on. Forgotten Democrats. Democrats is ramping up. I'm so thrilled. We had a town hall this week with Martin Kuz, who's reporting in uh, Afghanistan, or excuse me, Ukraine right now, as, as my other friend, uh, Tim Mack is. Uh, we had a town hall to talk about that. You can now just donate one-time donation. You no longer have to do it. Uh, because it's election year, I've gotten rid of the idea. You have to do a monthly donation. I would love to have you pop on over to Forgotten Democrats. Dot org. You can you can sign up. If you want to join our email list, it's text FRED to 33777. That's Forgotten Democrats couple bucks here. That money doesn't go to me. A little bit does go to me so I can talk to candidates, help candidates. But the majority, 75% of all the money you donate goes directly to the candidates, Democratic nominees for the House of Representatives who need the money the most. And this is our first cycle. But with your help, we will actually help some candidates this cycle. I'd really love to help those who need the money the most uh, this cycle. And there's a lot more to come with that. So that's a lot of talk, a lot going on in, in our lives, a lot going on in my life, as you can hear. I hope you'll check out all of our videos. I hope you'll stick with some my touch. And if you've got time, go over there and subscribe at the On Democracy Podcast on YouTube. Follow us everywhere, FP Wellman, wherever you can find me. In the meantime, you can tell, man, you tell, I tell you every week, we are in the fight. It's election year. Get in the fight, hang in there, and I'll see you next week right here on Democracy.